So thank you for joining us this afternoon for this webinar on the Code of Fundraising Practice Current Consultation, which looks at how to improve its accessibility, structure and clarity. I'm sitting here with Gerald Oppenheim, Chief Executive at the Fundraising Regulator, and Stephen Service, Policy Manager. Gerald and Stephen will be talking to us through in more detail about why the consultation is happening, the key changes that are being considered, and of course, how you can respond. And of course, there will be plenty of time at the end for Gerald and Stephen to answer any questions uh, you may have. Um, but let's kick off now with uh, Gerald, over to you. Thanks, Elizabeth, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to take you through the early slides in this presentation before handing over to Steve. What are we going to cover? We're going to look at a brief history of the code, how and why we propose to change it, the consultation timescale, and how you can get involved. Let's start by looking at the code itself and what it is. It sets out the standards expected of fundraisers across the UK, and it's a key part of maintaining public trust and confidence in the charity sector. It's the means by which charities demonstrate that they hold themselves accountable and that they'll handle any complaints they receive about fundraising appropriately. So it's the means by which we at the Fundraising Regulator consider complaints against charitable organisations which fundraise. And we're briefly going to stop with the first uh, poll question about your experience with the code. Thank you. Here's a, a brief history of the Code of Fundraising Practice. The code itself is several individual codes which have been brought together since 2005 by the Institute of Fundraising. And you can see a picture of a patchwork quilt, which is how the code feels it still is. It's an amalgam of several different codes covering different bits of fundraising, different means of fundraising. Over time, the code's also been used by our predecessors at the Fundraising Standards Board to start to investigate complaints about fundraising using the IOF code, as it then was, as a means of judging what had happened. In July 2016, after we were ready to uh, set up and to take over as the regulator, the code transferred to us from the Institute of Fundraising together with the fundraising rule books, in other words, the rule books that look at on-street, door-to-door, face-to-face fundraising, which had been owned by the former PFRA. And on that day in July, July the 7th, 2016, responsibility for investigating complaints transferred to the fundraising regulator, although if you were in Scotland, then the responsible regulator, the responsible panel there, is the Scottish Fundraising Standards Panel. But in both cases, the code, because it's a UK-wide code, is the basis for regulation and complaints handling. And the key question when a complaint comes in is, has the code been breached? So unlike the Charity Governance Code, the fundraising code includes rules because we need to have absolutes that we can regulate against rather than being purely values driven. Let's look at the code under our ownership. Since it transferred to us, we've tried to keep the code relevant to the challenges that charities face in their fundraising. This includes making sure you as charities and you as fundraisers know your responsibilities, whether you're a fundraiser, as I've said, or whether you're a trustee, working with donors or as part of a partnership with a third party. We've also looked to respond to the issues of most concern to you, including the changes we've made to clarify the rules for fundraisers and in particular on data and consent. Bringing us right up to date, we've also introduced some new rules 
that look at the way in which fundraising takes place on digital online platforms, recognizingly, recognizing the increasingly sophisticated way that the public fundraise with charities. And there on the slide, you can see the four bullet points covering the theme and the, the content of the spring 2017 consultation. A bullet point setting out that we made changes for data and consent ahead of GDPR and the Data Protection Act 2018 coming into effect on May the 25th this year. And then in June 2018, when we added the new sections about online fundraising platforms. And those the, the code guidance came with guidance for fundraisers, for the public and for the platforms themselves. So why are we consulting now? Our review of the code, which we've been doing almost continuously since we took it over, has been prompted by the feedback from our first consultation, where we included a section asking respondents to say what they thought might need to change. We've held some roundtable sessions with smaller charities. We've looked in detail at the, the inquiries we've had, the comments we've had, the questions raised by fundraisers and the public through both our inquiries function and through the complaints we've received. And we're in pretty continuous dialogue with other regulators and bodies like NCVO that represent the sector to get a rounded picture of what needs to change and how best we could do that and how best we could answer the key question in our first consultation about how easy the code is to understand, which many people very helpfully gave us views about. We're also aware that navigating the current code structure isn't easy. A few things jump out at you when you look at the code as it stands at the moment. The main code has got 20 sections in it covering general principles and behaviours, specific rules about types of fundraising, processing considerations, data protection, working with others to fundraise. So it's quite a mixture and there's no clear way of navigating the rules. We also include in the code rule books for face-to-face -face fundraising on street, door-to-door -door and on private sites. And then there are a whole range of legal appendices setting out the specific law that relates to sections of the code in much more detail. And there are also links to other guidance, including relevant references to the Information Commissioner, to Ofcom, to the Advertising Standards Authority, to the IOF, and to other parts of the guidance that we produce within the fundraising regulator, as well as to guidance produced by bodies like NCBO. Uh, and now for another quick poll question for you to answer. Stephen, do you want to now take over? Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, so um, I'll just say a bit more uh, now about the detail of the code uh, and what we're proposing to actually do uh, as part of this current consultation. I guess the first question is, why are we proposing to change the code? Um, that should be partly clear from Gerald's previous slide on the structure. But um, based on your feedback that we've received to date, we, we basically want to ensure that there is clarity on why the code exists and who it applies to. Um, in terms of the language of the code rules, we want to make this clearer and easier for you to understand. And we want to make it easier to know which parts of the code apply to your fundraising and ensure that the relevant guidance and the legal basis for rules are obvious within the body of the code, as opposed to being uh, available in separate documents. Uh, that's really helpful and uh, according to the previous poll that um, as just the results have just come through 77 percent of uh, people online are saying that the code could be better uh, we do have one last uh, quick question for everybody to fill in if um, you can see now uh, the poll coming up <laughs> 
so what why do you think 77 percent of respondents saying you could be better were you expecting that i think that's probably what gerald and i were hoping people would say i think if if a, a much smaller figure were saying that uh, that would be cause for concern for us in terms of why we started this exercise in the first place so that's certainly in in many ways uh, reassuring to hear you're not uh, doing this huge task for for nothing exactly um and i think the results are shortly coming through um in the meantime um in terms of the previous poll um there was a very small percentage of people who however said that um, they were completely dissatisfied uh, with with the cold. Sorry, I'm just coming through now. We've got um, results saying on how often people use the code, and it's it's an interesting breakdown. Nobody uses it every day. <laughs> um, well, like, not like us then. <laughs> I think exactly. I think the majority of people use it approximately every six months. That's about forty-one percent of respondents. Um, then you've got thirty-eight percent using it once a year or less, eighteen percent once a month, and one percent once a week. Would you like to see those? all those figures going up you'd like to see the code being used more often or are well, you fairly th comfortable with those results i think um it depends on how the code's used and i think we would expect the code to be applied in people's internal policies as well so you're not necessarily using the code every day as your your guide for everything you do but you're translating that into your uh, organization's internal policies and and making sure that it's reflected. That's probably more important than, you know, how often people mm. are using it or, or whether they're they're looking at it once a week, once a month or whatever. Yeah, so it's I, more about the reasons why they're using it rather than the frequency. Absolutely. And I think it will also depend on the familiarity of uh, each charity with the code and how often a fundraising campaign may be being run. If you only do one once a year, then perhaps you're not going to look at the code as often as a charity that's got many fundraising campaigns running all the time. Okay, thank you. Do you want to carry on? <laughs> yes, we can do. So um, just in terms of the scope of the consultation, uh, the bottom line here is that the primary intention is to make the code easier to use. It's not intended to make fundamental changes to the standards within the code, except where there is unnecessary repetition or, or contradiction of a rule existing elsewhere in the code, where the meaning may be unclear, including where ambiguity may make it difficult to consider whether charity is compliant from our point of view, um, or where a rule is inaccurate in relation to current UK law. And we'd obviously want to make sure it reflects the law as it currently stands. Um, so um, then just moving on in terms of that detail and what we're actually proposing uh, to change. Um, some questions we get from charities which are new to the code are, what is it? Why is it important? Does it apply to me? And, and how do we as a regulator consider complaints against it? Um, now, it may be surprising for some people to, to know, but that isn't really covered in the current uh, code. So we're looking to add a new introduction um, uh, and that will address all of these key points uh, to put the code in context. Another issue uh, that we've picked up from your feedback is that when you read the code, the tendency is to gravitate towards the sections that cover your type of fundraising. Uh, but some rules apply to the vast majority of fundraising methods, and we want to sh make sure that, that everybody is reading that general content as well as the content intended uh, for specific fundraising practices. So we're proposing to change the, the order of the code so that it's read in two parts. Um, there's the general rules relevant to all fundraising, 
and then there's the rules relevant to your specific fundraising practices. And that change is also designed to ensure you only read the parts of the code that are relevant to your fundraising. You shouldn't need to treat it as a document to be read from cover to cover. And I have had one or two small charities say to me, or oh, we read it um, as if it were a, a manual, a book. Um, uh, that is definitely not the kind of approach we would recommend with the code. I mean, obviously, if you want to do that, that's up to you. Um, but from our point of view, this is about making sure you access the parts that are relevant to you. In response to your request for greater clarity, we've added a glossary of key terms, and these identify how words are used in the context of the code. Um, just a caveat there, because one or two people I've spoken to about this already have said, uh, you know, this particular word, it means something different in the context of my particular charity or my organization. Um, that may be the case because what we're looking to do here is define these words in the context of how they're used in the code so you may see differences but where there are differences uh, that should be made clear in the glossary we've also asked uh, the plain english campaign to review the code against its standards for plain english and that includes uh, changes such as using a direct form of address. So talking about you must rather than the organization or the fundraiser must and emphasizing that most rules will apply to the staff of charitable fundraising organizations unless otherwise stated and making that really clear about who the code applies to and when. Um, Many of you who are smaller charities also say you have difficulty understanding some of the technical terminology used by fundraisers in bigger charities and, and the code does reflect some of that jargon at times. So we've tried to avoid that kind of technical language as far as possible. That doesn't necessarily mean simplifying the code at the expense of being precise. So where there's a substantive difference in meaning or a conflict with what the law requires, we've looked to use the most appropriate language on a case by case basis. And it's long been our intention uh, to bring the existing face to face fundraising rule books uh, relating to street, private site and door to door fundraising into the body of the code and currently and for some time have existed as, as separate, uh, separate documents. But we want to ensure there's a, a two way relationship between face to face fundraisers and the code. Um, firstly, we want to ensure that face to face fundraising organisations understand their responsibilities in the context of the whole code, not just those rules that are specific to face to face fundraising but also that the code properly reflects the content of the uh, rule books as a fundraising method. And there are, are many rules that in there that we feel could be more widely applicable in terms of uh, the work that fundraisers do in terms of public collections and their interaction with the public. Finally, we propose to bring uh, the legal appendices into the code and delete, merge or amend some rules. Uh, there, there's a, a deletions and mergers log, which we've added as an annex to the consultation, which sets out what we've identified for deletion and why. Um, and these largely deal with either rules which may have limited relevance to fundraising specifically, or which are likely to only be relevant in a very narrow local context. So two examples I've given there. Um, there's a whole uh, load of stuff around payment of, of trustees, which while I'm sure is useful for charities, uh, doesn't really have relevance to fundraising directly. Um, so we're effectively proposing to take that out. Um, and then in terms of the local context, um, one of the, um, the big rules that we're looking to change is, is the bit around the Three Peaks Challenge event, uh, which is a big local event, but the rules that apply to that are not really universal rules, they're very localised, so we're proposing to remove those. Um, 
We're also looking to, to take out those rules where they're currently repeated in multiple places. There are quite a few rules because, as Gerald said, there's been a kind of a patchwork quilt approach to date with the code. Quite a few places where the uh, rules may be repeated in, in different sections. So we want to make sure that isn't the case and that you're only reading them once. And also where there's detailed repetition of laws set and primarily enforced by other regulators. Um, so for example, there's, there's detailed rules at the moment in the code uh, contained about collection licenses. Um, that's one example where we'd propose that the local authority is probably best placed to advise as they set the conditions around licenses, as opposed for us uh, to include all of that detail um, in the code itself. Um, aside from the uh, consultation itself, we're all also looking uh, to provide additional guidance, tools and illustrative examples to help you translate the code into practice. We recognise obviously that knowing the rules is only one step with this um, you've also got to apply that in terms of what you do um, so once the consultations taken place we'll be looking at how we can make it real in terms of um, the fundraising that you do um, and part of that is also about how you access it in terms of our website. So we're looking to redevelop the code section of our website to increase the accessibility there, um, providing new ways to navigate the code online and potentially layer um, information based on different audiences. But that's obviously um, the early stages of development. So just to come on to the consultation questions, um, we're looking to get your views on uh, two specific questions. Firstly, do you agree with our approach? And I'm hoping that the survey results we've just seen will largely be reflected um, in support for um, the, the general line we're taking with this. Um, and then secondly, what are your views on the proposed changes? We've kept it very uh, open, very general. Um, if you want to respond uh, in detail uh, to uh, the uh, technical aspects of the changes, you're welcome to do that. If you only have interest in one particular area, at the same time, you're very welcome to submit views uh, on just that single area. So it's entirely up to you. We're flexible about how you respond, but we do encourage you to respond and let us know your thoughts so that we get this right. There's three um, key ways that you can respond to this consultation. Uh, you can go online and there's a survey monkey. Um, survey that's available through our, our the consultation page on our website. You can go uh, and email us with your response, or you can follow the old-fashioned method and uh, write to us by post uh, with any comments you may have. Uh, a quick look at the consultation timescale. Uh, the consultation will close on the 16th of November. Um, between December and January, uh, we'll be looking to do a full technical and legal review to obviously make sure that uh, any changes we're proposing uh, are uh, applicable in terms of what the law requires. And then in February 2019, we'll be putting the final changes to our board for final sign off. So the plan, at least at this stage, is that we can begin to implement the new code from March 2019 onwards. Um, we're very much uh, keen to hear your views on how we do that. That will be um, one of the challenges following the consultation. How do we make sure that people know about the new code? How do we make sure that we allow enough time for people to implement it uh, in terms of their processes? So please do let us know 
um, if you have any views on that. And then just finally to say, obviously we're now going to go on to a bit of a QA and a with, with Elizabeth, but if there are any other questions that strike you or as you read the consultation, any queries you have, do get in touch with us either by phone or, or through our inquiries email address um, and we can hopefully give you some further information uh, to help you respond effectively. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen and Gerald. And as we promised, there is plenty of time now for questions from you. So please do uh, send them through and uh, both Gerald and Stephen are ready to answer. We have had uh, a few questions um, sent already, so I'll kick off with those, and hopefully more will 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 come through as we as we talk. Um, the first question is possibly a reflection of how many changes you're suggesting, and it's um, somebody is asking whether uh, they need to respond to all the changes that you're making or can they just comment on the things that specifically are of interest to them? Thanks, well, a very important question. Um, we recognise that this is quite a big consultation. It covers uh, quite, quite a, a long draft. Um, we're basically asking people to comment on anything that they, they feel is important for them to comment on. So if you, as I said previously, if you want to comment on, um, each of the changes we're outlining, and I think there's kind of six core ones there, um, feel free to do so. If you only have views on a particular one and you don't really mind otherwise, um, then do that too. Um, the important thing is that your voice is heard in this and that you know you make sure that your your opinion is counted uh, when it comes to the to the new code as it will as it will look. Thank you. Um, you mentioned a number of times that one of the key aims is to simplify the language that is used in the code, and I think that's a that's a good thing. But one question is whether that means there's a risk that some important information will uh, get lost. That's obviously been a really difficult and challenging issue for us in um in reviewing the code so we went to plain english and we asked them for feedback on each of the rules in the code as it as they currently stand and they came back and and gave simplified versions of those rules and it was then um a process of us saying well you know does this simplification keep the general sense of what the rule is about or um, does it lose something in the in the translation from a more complicated rule to a simpler rule? So in some cases, we've you know gone with what Plain English uh, campaign have have suggested. In other cases, we've decided whether because it loses the the meaning of the rule, or because it's based on say a, a law that's already in existence, um, to keep. Uh, the language as it stands. So we very much haven't taken a one-size-fits-all approach to this. It's it's been a case of a case-by-case -case basis, basis in which we've gone through the code and checked. Just to add to that, um, Steve mentioned uh, a few moments ago that uh, before we publish the new code, we'll undertake a full technical and legal review. The legal review will be particularly important to make sure that there is still clarity in the rules and that where the law actually requires particular words to be used, we continue to do that and don't plainly English them out of existence. And uh, related to that uh, question is, uh, obviously the code applies uh, to the whole of the UK. And so how will you make it clearer for fundraisers that are operating in different parts of the country where the law may be slightly different? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think that's something that we, we definitely welcome views from, uh, from fundraisers who may be operating in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, and particularly Scotland and Northern Ireland where the legal uh, differences may, may be more acute. Um, 
but uh, what we're proposing in terms of the website is potentially an approach where we try and layer the information a bit more. So what we may be able to do is uh, ask you to identify, you know, what part of the country you're fundraising in um, before you access the code. And then what you see is basically your country's version of the code. But none of these things are fixed right now. I think it's, you know, how do we do this? We're sure that, you know, some of you fundraisers out there will have other ideas or, or ways we could do this, um, which will help make it clearer. Um, but it is, we recognize it, a big challenge at the moment. The other thing the code has to do, of course, is um, the reason why it's a UK wide code is that charities based in one country will often fundraise in another country within the UK where the law may be different. So they're going to have to have regard, as they do now, to different legal systems and the code will need to continue to reflect all of that. Um, thank you. And there's a question that's more about process. Um, one of the aims of the code is to maintain public trust and confidence in fundraising. So obviously the public's perspective is a very important one. And a question is whether you intend to involve members of the public as part of this consultation. Uh, yes, we absolutely do. Um, those of you that uh, responded to our first consultation um, back in 2016, 2017, uh, may recall that we did a piece of public research as part of that to, as a kind of a, a balance against what we were hearing from fundraisers. Um, we're looking to do something similar in this case, uh, a piece of research with the public, um, partly I think to assess uh, what impact uh, knowledge of the code and knowledge that charities um, use a code of practice has on public trust and confidence, if, if any. Um, so we'll be looking to do a piece of research um, around that, um, again, as a kind of a, a check and balance. Obviously, when you're talking to members of the public, uh, you can't ask the very detailed technical questions that we'll be asking of NCBO members and, and other fundraisers. Um, but what you can do is, is ask in more broad terms, um, you know, what they think about fundraising um, and how the issues raised in the code affect them. Um, another question is whether either probably after the consultation, once the code does change, whether the fundraising regulator intends to include any case studies or examples of good practice? Yes, very much so. So, I mean, this, this in initial process is very much the a first phase. So what we're trying to do is, is get the code itself and the rules themselves clear. And then beyond that, we can start to look at how we illustrate that, how we make that clearer for charities trying to use the code. So we're thinking things like case studies uh, in terms of complaints that we currently deal with and making closer links between the content in the code and, and casework that we've come up against. Um, and we're also looking at things like tools that can help you in your uh, in your current policies in, in your organization so that could be things like audit tools uh, we've seen some good examples from from other charities doing this in terms of you know am i uh, ticking off what i need to be doing in terms of the code um, so those kind of tools we think may be helpful as well uh, thank you. There's one question specifically about uh, small charities and the uh, the impact that some of the changes may have on small charities. And uh, particularly it's Tessa from the Small Charities Coalition. Um, and she asks whether you know how many members of the fundraising regulator are small charities? How many are signed up to the fundraising regulator? I suppose that to answer that question specifically is quite difficult because it depends what you mean by a small charity. Uh, because we're about fundraising, we know that there are very, very many charities that probably don't do major fundraising in the way that a large, well-known 
public public facing charity may do. What we do know is that there are around 1,750 charities that are covered by our levy. So they're spending more than £100,000 a year on fundraising. We know from previous discussions with the Small Charities Coalition that there will be a small number of the larger members of the Small Charities Coalition that are covered by the levy, but probably not a highly significant number, maybe 10, maybe 20 at the most, and it could be less than that. But we also know that there are 1,500 or so charities, and the number's rising all the time, who are outside the levy, so they spend less than £100,000 a year, who have registered with us for the £50 a year annual fee. So I think there'll be a lot of small charities in that grouping. OK, thank you. Um, one question is about uh, the use of social media, media and online fundraising and whether you're planning to produce any additional guidance on those two fundraising methods. Well, just to come back to Gerald's kind of introduction, um, we've we produced new guidance and new added new rules regarding fundraising platforms uh, to the code in the digital section of the code uh, back in in June. So um, that's definitely worth looking at if if that's an aspect you you're involved with or or you're interested in. Um, I think the the social media point is an interesting one. If um, there are particular aspects of social media and, and fundraising through that form that you don't feel is currently covered within the code, um, do let us know because you know we're reviewing the code all the time. We're looking at what needs to change in order to, to reflect current practice. And if there are gaps there that you feel things aren't covered uh, and, and there are methods that, that you know use other other methods and other ethical issues that may come out of using those methods um, we want to know about them. We're certainly aware from the work that we've done already with the online fundraising platforms, the Just Givings, the Virgin Money Giving and so on of, 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 of the uh, that are around, um, that some of the large social media giants have also got uh, means for people to fundraise either for straightforward crowdfunding you might say for someone else who wants to do something or for charitable purposes on their sites now and I think the next stage for us will be to engage with Facebook and Google and so on to try and make sure that they are not just aware of the code but like so many of the online platforms now absolutely signed up to the principles and the values around fundraising that the code sets out alongside the rules. Stephen, you mentioned earlier that the code isn't just a manual to read pay from page one to page 90, but obviously that depends very much on the fundraising regulator's website. Um, what are you planning uh, to do to make the pages, the web pages, easier to navigate and easier to use? Well, I don't want to preempt too much um, that particular project because that is something we would be looking at following this consultation and i think there's you know maybe a number of things that we could consider as part of that um, but what we want to do bottom line is is make it more user friendly um, and potentially look at you know whether there are there's more than one way of accessing the code um, in terms of the different audiences that use the website so one of the things that we've considered we've um, in the last year, rebuilt our, our current, uh, our wider website for the fundraising regulator, as many of you may have seen if you've been on the site. Um, one of the questions that we looked at with that was, you know, who's accessing the site and, you know, how are they accessing the site? Are there different users who require different pieces of information? And if so, how can we bring that to the fore, uh, depending on the type of audience? So that's certainly something we'll be considering as part of the review of the code section of the website. Um, but we're hoping we can come up with some more innovative solutions that may be a, 
have been there previously in terms of how the code's presented. Okay, well, that's the end of the questions that have come through from the audience, but that doesn't mean that uh, there won't be other opportunities to ask uh, you questions through the um, email addresses that are included on the slides. Is there anything else either of you would like to add? Only to thank everyone for taking part this yeah. afternoon and to encourage everyone to respond to the consultation because we want to make sure that at the end of it we have a code that is useful to you as charities and you as fundraisers. Yes, and just to, to echo Gerald's thanks, um, we hope that you'll go online, uh, have a look at the consultation if you haven't already done so, and send in your responses. Um, as we said, it's, it's vital that this reflects your current fundraising practices, how you access the code, what your needs are. So let's make this as good as it can be um, for the new year. Uh, we will be emailing you the slides of this presentation, so you will have all the information about the consultation and how to respond. And as Stephen said, please do respond because this is a great opportunity to make sure that the code works for you and makes your job easier. Uh, in the meantime, uh, first of all, I'd like to apologize. There were some slight uh, sound issues at the start of the webinar, but I think they were then resolved. So hopefully you heard us all as clearly as possible. Uh, and if I could thank uh, Stephen and Gerald for taking the time and talking us through all the changes that are being consulted on and the uh, massive uh, project that they've uh, taken, not taken on uh, over the next couple of months. Thank you everybody for joining us and again do respond to the consultation. <laughs>